Hi, everyone. So welcome to today's uh, Lunch and Learn for Parkinson's Awareness Month. Um, today, we will be having a discussion uh, with our rehab partners from Robert Wood Hamilton. And uh, we will have Ina Levine from Speech Therapy and Jin Bao Jung from Physical Therapy here to talk about what resources they have to offer and uh, how to keep up with the exercises and therapies uh, during a pandemic as it's you know a little bit different than it's been in the past and uh, let you know how returning back to more in-person therapies are able to be done safely and effectively, and um, we're encouraging our patients to do so. Um, uh, we have 83 people registered for today's webinar. So that's the highest to date out of the four that we've done. Uh, currently, we have about 35 people on, so we'll just give it a minute or two um, uh, before we, we really get going. And for those that have uh, attended before, you know who I am, but for those that haven't, my name is Dr. Jill Farmer. I'm the director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Program with Global Neuroscience Institute. And I have thoroughly enjoyed providing patient uh, Park Parkinson's patient education. Um, usually we do this in a live format, but with things going on, we've switched over to virtual, but hopefully next year we'll be able to get back to our um, one day symposium where everybody gathers and we get to meet with vendors and we get to meet with resources from the community. Uh, we have a nice breakfast and we just have a good day of education and camaraderie. Um, so as you go through the scroll of what GNI has to offer and our movement disorder team, you'll also see that today we've included um, our rehab partners as well, so that you have the opportunity to learn their names and learn how to get in touch with them uh, should, you, should you need to. So with that, I will ask everyone to unmute so we can get started. Okay. So. It looks like Jinbo does not have a video by the looks of it. Not. Yes. And let me see if I can. Yes, it sounds like he is. He's on though. He should be listening. He's on. Oh, there he yeah, is. I can, yeah, I can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um. So, with this, we're just going to start with the discussion. Oh. And we are lucky that Pamela is joining us as well. So um, with that, let's get going. Who would like to go first uh, to describe the, what they're doing and how they are interacting with the Parkinson's community? Um, I guess I can go first. Okay. Hi there. <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> It's kind of hard to tell. How many people do we actually have on this? I will be too. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Ina, and I am a speech therapist here at RWJ, um, our outpatient office on Quaker Ridge Road. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been a speech therapist for, I think, almost 20 years, actually more than 20 years. And, um, you know, this is a general practice, outpatient speech therapy clinic, but traditionally I have had quite a number of patients with Parkinson's disease as well as related movement disorders, including, you know, Parkinson's plus syndrome and, you know, multiple system atrophy, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I love working with Parkinson's patients because the reason I love working with Parkinson's patients is because, um, for the vast majority, right, of this population, speech, speaking, communicating becomes a problem at some point in um, as the, in their disease progression. Um, and you know, the the cardinal features of the Parkinson's disease as it affects speech production is could be slowness of movement, usually uh, reduced loudness. It's just difficult to generate the loudness that's necessary uh, for the people to be understood. So um, 
the focus of our therapy of the services that we provide right here in the outpatient setting is to get patients to use their best voice to get them to speak as loudly, as clearly, and as effectively, and to not lose that engagement, that communication with their family, with their friends, with their community to maintain the best possible life that you guys possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, Parkinson's is a slow progressing disease traditionally, so there is lots of room for improvement and for maintaining that good speech and that you know, functional communication and a good quality of life. Um, we offer a, a, variety, a couple of packaged programs, including, um, I'm sure you guys have heard about the Lee Silverman voice treatment program, the LSVT Loud, which is probably the better known of the programs. It's been around for a while. There has been a lot of research done on its efficacy. Um, and there is also something called Speak Out for Parkinson's disease, which is a newer program, which I started offering within the past year, works really well with those patients that um, you know, are unable or you know, un unable to come to outpatient setting in person. Telehealth works really well for that as well. Um, and uh, so those are the two major package programs. And then of course, you know, as needed based on the patient's needs, we can modify those as needed. Can you speak a little? Deficits. Can yeah. you can you speak a little bit more about the Speak Out program since that's a little newer? All right. So it does have some Speak Out programs. It does have similarities to um, the LSVT Loud in that it is a behavioral treatment approach, and really the goal is to get the patients to speak with intent. Mm -hmm. The thought process being is that. Um, you know, we need to bypass bypass the, the basal ganglia control circuits, right? Mm -hmm. To take advantage of speech behaviors that are less reliant on dopamine. Mm -hmm. So basal ganglia, dopamine controls automatic movement. We tend to, to think of speech and swallowing as an automatic task. And of course that becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we train the patient to speak with intent, intent and deliberation to consciously and volitionally control their loudness, their articulation, their diction, their clarity, and also their, you know, the, the shape, the, the prosody of the voice to speak, speak like the CEO of a company, mm -hmm. to not let speech become automatic. Put yourself into that conscious speaking mode, like you want to be heard all the time, every single word. It's almost like public speaking all the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it sounds like. And yeah, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 fun. Actually, it's a great program to run. How does it differ from the LSVT traditional loud program? So it is not. I feel like it's not maybe as like physiology intensive. So uh, first of all, it's shorter. The sessions are forty-five minutes as opposed to an hour. Um, the sessions are three times a week. Uh, best case scenario, two consecutive days, and then one day later on that week, 45 minutes, regular home practice, and there are several components of, um, of each therapy session that requires voice warm-ups just to get those vocal cords moving, and then some automatic tasks, counting, reading, and then some kind of, you know, fun cognitive tasks. It could be naming, it could be discussion, question, question answer, mm -hmm. singing, so we make it fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we make it interesting, we make it engaging, and then of course, you know, with Parkinson's disease, speaking loudly does not necessarily become automatic, so there is that practice component. Sure. Try to get so, the family family involved yeah, so and that the patients don't lose their skills. You've already highlighted two very important things, practice, mm. doing it at home after the sessions are, are completed, so. I think exercise uh, should become, it, it should become part of a daily routine, just like, you know, people that want to keep in shape, go to the gym or they jog or mm -hmm. they do some crunches at home for Parkinson's speech, that practice to keep the skills going, keep the muscles engaged is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And and so you mentioned going to the gym. So let's give uh, Jimbo <laughs> a, a, a bit to introduce himself and what's going on from the PT world for the Parkinson's community. Hi everyone, I, I'm so sorry about the, this video because the, I used it yesterday and somehow they updated the whole system. Oh, so no. now I couldn't do it. 
But anyway, uh, my name is Jimbo Jong, a uh, physical therapist at the Robert Wood, and I mainly work at the Balance Center. <clears throat> um, uh, we can offer the, um, uh, actually, a lot of uh, physical therapists that our uh, organization, uh, they're uh, certified for the uh, LSVT big program. So I believe that uh, you're not going to have any problem uh, make the schedule as you need it. And uh, I've been dealing with the uh, Parkinson's patient about, yeah, seven, eight, maybe 10 years. Um, just like the, you know, I mentioned is that uh, main thing is uh, uh, you have to practice, practice, mm. practice. And this, uh, unfortunately, this has to be part of your life. Mm -hmm. And as a, uh, everybody knows that uh, Parkinson's disease is slowly progress disease. So, Right now, we try to uh, maintain whatever they have it to uh, take care of themselves and uh, live the daily life. So if you don't do uh, <clears throat> the activities or the exercises, and unfortunately, your uh, progress will be going backward and even quicker. So I always emphasize that, yeah, try to make a good habit of this exercise program um, to make uh, and uh, maintain the, the, your functional level. But I understand that this whole pandemic uh, make a lot of people uh, really, really hard to get out of the house and uh, make the uh, schedule. However, uh, since the uh, uh, vaccination started, it seems like the, I'm seeing more and more uh, client at the uh, clinic. So you bring up a good point for both of you. How do you help patients motivate themselves to continue to do this at home? Because that's, um, when I give my talk in the office, I say everybody goes through the, through the um, sessions and then it's human nature where you'll be pretty good for, you know, a few weeks or a few months after, and then everybody sort of falls off the wagon a little bit and you have to go back in for some, some refresher or some maintenance. But uh -huh. are there any strategies that you tell your patients to try and help maintain a level of commitment to doing the exercises when they're home? So, well, one of the things that needs to happen right in the beginning of a treatment program is the patient has to kind of buy in into this whole scenario. So it's almost like a contract that we have informally that this is, I'm going to teach you to do these things that are going to improve your voice a lot. You know, are you up for practicing this at home. So people and, and families need to understand what's involved and commit to it. Um, so cognitive, you know, from the cognitive perspective, patients will do things, will be more willing to practice. Well, just like all of us, all of us are more willing to, to do things which are enjoyable, pleasant, and give us that sense of satisfaction. So I always get, I talk to patients about their interests and about what motivates them. Um, so get a sense of their interests, get a sense of their needs. What is it that's gonna get them to practice? Is it being able to call their grandchild? Mm -hmm. Or to be able to handle that meeting at work? You know, I did have uh, quite a few patients who were still actively working in positions that required um, some public speaking. So kind of like, you know, motivating the patient by making it meaningful and relevant, and also by regular check-ins check-ins with ourselves, even if the, when the core component is over, I do check on patients first bi-weekly and then once a month and also getting the family on board. Okay. So um, I, will I will tell my patients that, hey, you know, your wife, your, your sister has been instructed to be on top of you because you may <laughs> forget life gets in the way. So <laughs> we're all buying into this, right? It takes a village. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For you to maintain that great speech quality in general, I mean, most people are on board. Yeah. People that kind of balk at this may not necessarily opt for something that's this intensive and go through a more traditional therapy approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with Ina, yeah. I said Thank mainly uh, I emphasize the two things. The first one is the patient, a client uh, themselves, they have to be self-motivated. Yeah, self-motivated. I think there's no other choices you are I mean it's a good start because they interest in getting this uh program and they want to do get better right but it's so, tended oh I'm sorry go ahead you know no no go ahead I'll, I'll 
I'll say something after you're done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so I just kind of form with uh, uh, my client that I don't give them any choices about the self motivation. Okay. And a lot of times they understand and because they want to get better. And uh, usually program uh, lasts about four weeks, very intensive mm -hmm. program, and they see their progress after second week, mm -hmm. after fourth week. So that gives them more motivation. However, I totally understand as time goes, that motivation fades away. So that time or in the beginning of a program, just like Ida mentioned that family, family support, that is very, very important. Yeah, because of the, if a family not involved with it, client is, uh, themselves, they're not gonna do it because, of the, <laughs> because of there is nobody bothering them to do so. So I, no, uh, I record, I record some of my patients before and after treatment mm -hmm. and I record um, segments with really good voice so I could use that as a reference. Oh, absolutely. This is absolutely. what your voice sounds like mm -hmm. when you're putting in the effort, when you're practicing, look how great it sounds. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. that gives patients, you know, a benchmark. Basically. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, I do. Uh, I use the, uh, their smartphone because mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of uh, hip hop. Uh, regulation, everything. So I use their uh, yeah cell phone. I, I I just record them yeah. how they walk. After then, two weeks later, four weeks later, mm -hmm. we record it and then we uh, compare. So they can definitely see visual feedback that oh, this is working, yeah. right? And I'm doing better. Well, this is good. I sound example. good. Yeah. Yeah. Because now I can in the office say, well, if they saw either one of you for their therapy, let me see that video on oh, their yeah. phone so <laughs> I can reinforce what I know they've been able to accomplish. So, yeah, uh, excellent. We do recognize, I just wanted to add something that, um, you, you know, lack of dopamine does affect motivation Absolutely. and drive, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. So there is that component and I do discuss it with the patients and families that, you know, it's not you, it's your brain. This is your basal ganglia. This is what it does to you, right? We are going to override it, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. We're going to work around it. You need to externally motivate yourself by telling yourself, okay, this is my brain. This is what it's doing. This is the disease. I'm going to fight it, mm -hmm. okay? I'm going to take control of my body, of my walking, and of my speech. Absolutely. I, I think patients find that very empowering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then from my end, that's why when I'm talking to patients all the time, I say it is a combination. So mm -hmm. my medicines that I can help give might help make that conscious thought of participating and motivating and things like right. that a bit easier, but it's not its own and simple, it's not the single way to manage it. And just like mm -hmm. with therapies that you're talking about in the different modalities, what you're saying is there has to be buy-in, there has to be the mm -hmm. um, impetus to do this for yourself. Um, and that might be a desire, but not necessarily able to be followed through on. And that's why my medicines are on board. So mm -hmm. it is a seesaw of both things. And I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, no matter where patients are on the spectrum with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. uh, the dual modality of therapy, exercise, and mm -hmm. um, medication right. is, is supremely important. Yeah, I agree. Um, so just a little uh, um, uh, housekeeping for anybody that is new to this format. This is a webinar format, which means that you'll see the speakers, but you won't see yourselves on the screen. Um, so you're muted and there's no video. Uh, if you wish to ask questions, and I hope that you do, because we're getting some that are trickling in, uh, please use either the Q&A function, which you'll see on the bottom of the screen, it'll say mm -hmm. Q&A, or the chat function. Um, which you'll also see at the bottom of the screen that says chat. You can click on either of those and type in your questions and we'll address them as we go along. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the first question that we got, um, uh, one of the attendees uses a breather fit and has questions if you ever work with a device like that. Uh, is that a question for me, I guess? I'm guessing so. I I think so. <laughs> have, you know what? I have not, but if you want to, I can, um, you know, I can look up some information and get back to you. So whoever typed in that question, if you want to 
put a couple of word description as to what it is uh, in the chat function or the Q&A, um, then uh, we can talk about it a little bit more as well. And then uh, there was a question about, can wearables like a Fitbit help with motivation? Actually, yes, um, especially uh, I believe that there is the balance program and the yoga program on Fitbit with the, that uh, balance board. And a lot of, uh, uh, as, uh, I wouldn't say younger generation, but uh, if you're someone who familiar with uh, this kind of uh, game system platform, yeah, so absolutely they can uh, benefit from that. And ultimately it's fun. <laughs> so yeah. that, yeah, that make uh, everything a little bit easier, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, before I forget, I'm gonna just uh, print the two website. Oh, we I see. see. Yeah, they can find it a lot of uh, um, the exercise program. So right now there are two big trends for the uh, Parkinson exercise program. One, uh, all the one is just like Ina mentioned that okay. LSVT program, which is LSVT big program. And <sighs> another one is a newer one is they call the power of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. This is a nonprofit organization, and they have a lot of free uh, YouTube videos on that, their website, and you can find it on YouTube channel as well. So I'm going to just uh, uh, type in those two websites. So if anybody interested and uh, feel like, oh, I want to find out what's the uh, exercise program run through, so the, the, uh, this will give the good idea, okay? That that's excellent. I I knew that LSVT definitely had a website that was oh, yeah. pretty robust. I did not know about Power for Parkinson's. Is that the same thing as PWR or is that different? Parkinson's Wellness Recovery. Oh, I I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure about that one. So there, but that just goes to show you that. There are many things that are available um, and accessible online. So again, mm -hmm. help with maintaining activity levels at home. I know it's not the same as somebody looking over your shoulder, telling you how to do something and do it um, you know, appropriately, uh, but it is a good substitute so that you have some direction for, for what to do. And aside from these programs, I'll also type in there's rock steady boxing. Mm -hmm. And so if you just type that into uh, Google, you'll it'll come up on their website and it'll give you uh, locations where they're doing both in-person and virtual programs. And as well as Dance for PD, um, that is something that is local. We have a, um, um, a program in Princeton that does it for those that are um, attending that are local to the area, but they also have online uh, dance classes that you can look into. Um, the uh, other questions that we were, that we got, let's see. Um, can, can the speak out program be done in video chat because of the COVID pandemic? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, one thing about that though, uh, my personal preference, I just think the right way to to do this is to do an initial evaluation in person because there are other components, there are other features of the voice that I, of the patient's overall presentation that is very difficult for me to assess via a video chat. For example, posture, breath support, um, any kind of things like tongue movement and just to do a good oral exam and to get stimulability testing, it's good to get numbers, some kind of a baseline. So video does have its limitation. After the initial evaluation and after I get an opportunity to record your voice, then the rest of the program can definitely proceed virtually with video conference. And I do have, I do have one gentleman that I see regularly with very good results. So now would be a good opportunity, I guess, to highlight mm -hmm. what are the safety measures and precautions that you guys are doing for in-person visits, especially for speech therapy, if there's a question about masking and things mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Uh, so masking, I think, is the right. Masking and distancing mm -hmm. are, are the obvious safety features uh, for we do provide myself and the patients with transparent masks. So okay. you can see my mouth. A lot of the patients are hard of hearing and really need my mouth cues. And I would like to be able to see the patient's mouth. If I need to do an intraoral exam on, we, know, we, we are hands-on 
discipline, you know, with see and touch patients. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then 95 and the mask and the face shield mm -hmm. will go on my face so that I don't inadvertently get any particles on you. We may ask you to remove your mask so I can peek inside your mouth, make sure that we're not dealing with any structural or physiological abnormalities, things like that. So, um, we maintain social distancing within the clinic. All surfaces are disinfected between the patients. The space is very well ventilated. Uh, we have not had a single case of patient to patient or therapist to patient transmission in this facility since the pandemic started. So I'd like to keep it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and I, I have encouraged my patients to participate to their mm. comfort level throughout yes. the pandemic. Yes. And and I have I would absolutely agree that there is, there has been supreme safety measure and mm -hmm. precautions taken. And now those will still continue to be in effect, yes. even though everyone is getting vaccinated and mm -hmm. there's another level of, yeah. protection, but there will still be the, the PPE and the visual yes. um, uh, cues and concerns to, for maintaining safety. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a, a, I'm so glad you guys are being active via the chat. Yeah. And &A. I have a lot of, I have a lot of questions here. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. typing a lot of answers too. <laughs> um, <laughs> the answers, but we're also going to speak the answers as well because the patient can't oh can't see the I don't know if they can see all of the Q and A in the chat. Um, so there is a question about the science behind big and rock steady boxing. So I see that you're in the process of typing an answer, uh, Jinbo. But if you wouldn't mind speaking to that yeah. as well. Oh uh, sure, yeah. For uh, the answers, I'm not sure about uh, exercise actually change the neurotransmitter uh, uh, maybe production and uh, anything like that. I don't see any research about it yet. I am, I'm, sure, mm -hmm. I'm sure they're gonna work on it uh, soon. Mm -hmm. However, uh, a lot of research shows a more functional progression. So which uh, somebody who finished the big program and RSV program, they are able to maintain their highest functional level achieved from the, this program a lot longer than who uh, did or who does a uh, traditional program. So again, uh, for a specific uh, question about the impact on the PD brain, I'm not sure, I don't have an answer for that one. However, a lot of research shows the functional level or their activity level per daily activity or sports activity is improving and yeah. they are able to maintain last longer than right. any other uh, traditional uh, physical therapy programs. And, and I could speak a little to the, to the brain part of it. Um, there, there is research to show that it doesn't necessarily matter which particular type of physical activity that you do, but mm -hmm. physical activity in general, when done on a routine basis, can help of not course. create more dopamine, but it will help release the dopamine and the dopamine precursors oh. in the brain um, that is uh, that are available. So it's like getting a little bit of boost of, of medication. And it is because you do that, it doesn't mean that it uses us up more because another question I often get asked in the clinic is, I sometimes feel so wiped after my workout sessions and it takes me a day or two to recover. And I explain that there's a little bit of normalcy to that, but just because you totally. feel wiped, it doesn't mean that you've used up more dopamine than, than you're making and it's a bad thing. It's actually a good thing um, uh, to get a little bit of that, that you worked well enough to cause a little bit of fatigue that you can then get some uh, restorative nature for after the fact. And there's also a whole bunch of science around neuroplasticity of course. and exercise. Um, so without question, there is a, a physiologic as well as a functional um, uh, uh, rationale for doing exercise and therapy programs. So, and same with voice. So Parkinson's in itself does not cause muscle weakness. It's a movement disorder, but it doesn't make the muscles weak per se, right? I th it's mm -hmm. the inactivity, the reduced activity that's associated with the slower mm -hmm. movement or just less activity in general that's causing, that's muscle weakness from just from disuse. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, intensive exercise and pushing you guys, you know, over your baseline kind of physiological limit that's what you need to recruit more muscles to do that activity it actually makes the muscles stronger 
Mm -hmm. So yes, and of course there is fatigue initially, right after an hour long of intense exercise, but I think you wind up building more muscle during that period of rest in between sessions, just mm -hmm. like in any other kind of exercise. I'm sure those of you that work out at the gym are very well familiar with that. Mm -hmm. You need to go a little bit beyond what you think you're capable of. Yeah. And both so me and Jimbo, we're pushy therapists. <laughs> you come in here, you're going to work. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's true. So whenever I get the question of, is there anything specific that I should be doing? My, my response is one, do the thing that you like, because that's the thing mm -hmm. that you're going to do more frequently and more readily. The other thing is just to make sure it challenges you. Because I, I will always say walking is great exercise, but if you're not really pushing yourself while you're walking, you're still getting benefit, but you're not getting anywhere near the benefit that you could if you were walking at a brisker pace or if you were swinging your arms while you were doing it. So it, standing on one foot every once in a while to check your balance, like something that will challenge you to some degree because that's what's going to elicit the change yep. down the road. Um, a question about, I participate in Sing Loud for PD and uh, I sing in church, uh, is my singing voice has deteriorated. Would speech therapy programs help with a singing voice? Yes, it will. And for those patients who are singers, mm -hmm. and I did have a couple over the years, we will incorporate singing activities as part of either LSVT or the Speak Out program. So we may do more things on stretching the vowels, working on the range. You know, that's not necessarily, for example, for speak out, that's not a core part of the program, but, you know, each patient is different and everybody's demands are different. So if singing is important to you, one of the cognitive exercises may focus on singing. Um, yep. I just got a request to just reintroduce for anybody that has come in late. So I'm Dr. Jill Farmer. I'm a movement disorder specialist with Global Neuroscience Institute. And our panelists today include Inessa Levine, who's a speech therapist with Robert Wood Hamilton, and Jinbo Jung, who is a physical therapist also with Robert Wood Johnson Hamilton. These are located in New Jersey. Um, I saw someone is from Maryland. So that might be a little mm. bit of a, of a drive for you, unless you have family that you want to come visit with in New Jersey. Uh, but but please reach out because um, we might be able to help direct you to resources that are a little bit closer that yes. might also be um, uh, relevant uh, for, for the types of programs that we're offering here. Sing, not, yes, yeah, Sing Out is the name of the new program or Speak Out, sorry, Speak Out, speak out yeah. program. And it's a national program? It is, um, well, the certification can be, you know, so the physical clinic is in, I want to say Dallas, Fort Worth, in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. um, I did, <clears throat> in the chat bar, I did provide the website for mm -hmm. the program for anybody who is interested. The founder of the whole, um, of the whole program actually does daily speak out exercises for the general public. And I think it's on YouTube and it's at 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, so I think I encourage you guys to check that out and it will give you an idea as to the structure of mm -hmm. the program. It is not a replacement for individual speech therapy, um, but this is something that the founder does basically for the larger community during the pandemic as she knows that not everybody has an access to a provider. Um, yeah. another, another question we got, is it recommended that someone just diagnosed in early stages be evaluated for speech therapy? I think it is a good idea to get a baseline, to get baseline, um, to really m measure the voice and record the voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, it helps to monitor change over time. Okay, um, even for patients, and I did have some patients who came in and they were, a speech goes essentially asymptomatic. And those patients that would provide with some home exercises to keep their voices warm, basically. And that's a, good, yeah. that's a good reminder for me as well as a movement specialist. And I will say mm -hmm. I fall into the pattern that everybody gets an early evaluation for PT because mm -hmm. it's so visual. Like I, I can see you shuffling a little bit. I can mm -hmm. see you not swinging that arm as much, uh, but you sound good when you're talking to me, but I'm only talking to you for yeah. 40 minutes to an hour. So um, it's, it is a good reminder to do just that and get a mm -hmm. baseline. 
way because we yeah. know hypophonia is something that will will come up during the course well, eventually yeah mm -hmm. yeah and the other thing is the uh, initial stage i mean early stage uh, a lot of my clients they don't notice because they couldn't see themselves and uh, when I point out, oh, okay, just like a Dr. Farmer said, okay, your gait is a little bit delayed or you didn't do your arm swings or you did something uh, uh, different than usual or the normal. And uh, when I point out those things and uh, my clients are kind of a little bit surprised because uh, they didn't think that way. So. so both speech and physical exercise helps early on, helps to slow down deterioration it slows down the disease pro progression so i think it is a good idea to at least get eva an evaluation and if not a full speak out program if it's not necessary at least a home exercise program okay to keep to keep your voice as strong as possible um, there is a lot of education involved about things that can be done at home to maintain the best possible the best possible speech and voice. However, very often what happens is the patient thinks that they sound fine. And again, this is part of the, you know, the dysfunction in the, in the dopamine regulation. And then the, the family will tell me, no, the voice is changing. You know, it's a little softer. It may be a little slushy. Mm -hmm. So there is that perception, self-perception issue. Absolutely. That may need to be addressed early on. Um, I just want to take an opportunity mm -hmm. to talk about something else with speech therapy that mm -hmm. isn't always as forefront of the mind because everybody thinks of it as loud therapy and things like that. But mm -hmm. cognition is a big mm -hmm. part of Parkinson's as well. So can you speak a little bit about the type of cognitive assessments or cognitive therapies that you can do as a speech therapist? Okay. So um, what I've been seeing as far as cognition is a bit of a decline in memory. Mm -hmm. So I work with patients to basically develop compensatory strategies whenever possible, okay? To keep track of their daily routine, help them manage their medications, you know, setting alarms in their phones, keeping schedules, keeping a routine going. Um, there are cognitive exercises such as memory and attention exercises and brain stimulation activities that we perform as well. What I find is that actually as part of both LSVT and Speak Out program, the cognitive component, basically a lot of word finding activities, it could be repetition activities, it could be naming, it could be almost like word search type of games, questions, answers, they help to improve cognition at least in the short term mm -hmm. for you know, the activities of daily living in the foreseeable future. Now, if, used to thinking. is this something that if we send for a speech evaluation, it's part of the general evaluation or do we have to indicate this specifically on a referral? So I think it should be, a, it should be, a spe, right, it should be specifically indicated and that will probably be a separate assessment just okay. because the LSVT, the loud and the speak out assessment protocols just for speech and voice. Mm -hmm will pretty much consume the entire session. So if there is concern about memory and general thought processes, there are assessment tools for that. Gotcha. And that's that's a separate appointment. And then but you know, if any, um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to finish my thought. <laughs> if there are cognitive, right? If there are significant cognitive issues, for example, in somebody who also have a Lewy body dementia, mm -hmm. which is not uncommon to coexist with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. we, will we will modify both LSVT and the speak out protocols accordingly, obviously to take the patient's abilities into account. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that as well for, for all of the attendees, if you are being referred for speech therapy, but you also have cognitive concerns, make mm -hmm. sure that you bring that up to yes. your doc so that we write the referrals accordingly. Because mm -hmm. we don't always remember to delineate which is which of the thing that we need yeah. to make sure that we give you the right things. Um, so let's see what else has come up. There was, we talked a little bit about, uh, cognition and dementia right now. There was another question about acting out of dreams. So acting out of dreams is something called REM behavioral sleep disorder, which mm -hmm. is very common in Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative and neurocognitive diseases. Um, it is because of those Lewy bodies, as we just mentioned, which is really the pathology that 
impacts the transmission of dopamine and the nerves that make dopamine in the brain. So Lewy body is a general term for the pathology behind things like Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, um, uh, other types of Parkinsonisms, things like that. So um, in REM behavioral sleep disorder, it can either predate a diagnosis by decades where you have this longstanding history of acting out your dreams, um, but it doesn't have to be consistent. It can come and go every once in a while. And then it can also happen at any point in time during the course of Parkinson's. And the way that we treat it is with medication, um, if it's necessary to do that. And that can either be over-the-counter melatonin, but more commonly it's clonopin or clonazepam, mm. uh, just at bedtime to help quiet down that activity level. Um, let's see, as more uh, questions come in. Oh, this is a great question. And one that I meant to ask, I had on my list to ask as well, if we were running, um, uh, short on questions, how do you manage particularly for physical therapy? Patients have other conditions. They'll often have arthritic changes or lumbar changes or disc changes that cause pain that may be exacerbated by Parkinson's, but is it not itself caused by Parkinson's disease? So how do you adjust or modify or, suggest patients participate in physical therapy, but do so so that it is not overly painful or not going to exacerbate other conditions? Okay, um, so there are two things. Uh, I can usually run the uh, two programs, of the LS, uh, uh, especially for the LSVT big program. And if someone, uh, I mean, not necessarily pain, uh, the patient uh, who has the later stage or stage four or five of the Parkinson, but they want to participate in, and I just modified their program. I mean, yeah. essential of a program is the same. However, I can just change their position instead of standing or sitting, something like that. And uh, if I feel like, oh, this is uh, uh, this pain is more than patient can handle, usually I refer to the uh, another doctors, another uh, medical professional, so help out the pain. And uh, uh, the other thing is, if someone who has a little bit back pain or a little bit joint pain, who can kind of tolerate it or who can manage okay. And a lot of uh, LSBT big program research shows that when you do this program, they can manage that, that pain as well in the end. So a lot of times I told them that, okay, you have a back pain, let's try to this program. And I just kind of uh, check them that how's your pain level. And I monitor them throughout the session. If that pain levels increase, I can just modify, uh, modify the program for the, that moment or that uh, section. Okay. Yep. So in other words, it'll be taken into consideration, but it's not an excuse. Even if you have a history of back pain or back issues, um, we're still going to try and find a way that some form of therapy regimen can be done and done effectively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys still want me to answer the question about the breather fit? It's just sure. that this is, looks like it's a, it's a brand name or a particular type of a device, but what, what this is is EMST, correct? So somebody, one of the one of the participants, um, said, "I use the breather, the breather fit. Do you ever work with that?" Yes. So if basically uh, you know inefficient respiratory support is preventing you from realizing your full potential as far as getting a really good speech and vocal quality, we may incorporate. EMST, so expiratory muscle strength training, maybe before starting either LSVT or um, the speak out program. So generally, um, just the act of increasing loudness and producing that intentional voice will automatically get people to take a deeper breath and control their breath a little bit better right, for the purposes of speech. But if you have, but if you have a respiratory muscle involvement, we may get to work on that before proceeding with the speech program. Or the other option is to just scale down the criteria for, for your voice, maybe scale it down five or 10 decibels, if that's what your respiratory system permits. So it does not, but you know, having, you know, using the breather or EMST device is not a contraindication 
to working on your voice. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Got a question that came in. Is there any hope of treatment to reduce the Lewy bodies in the brain? So that is what the next generation of research is looking at. It is looking at disease modifying therapies. Um, and one of, I think the very first session we did this uh, Parkinson's Awareness Month um, on the first Friday of April is uh, talking about meds in the pipeline. And we talk about those therapies that are being looked at through different types of vaccines, through uh, genetic uh, therapies, through borrowing from other conditions like cancer to look to see if they can be repurposed to try and help clear out the gunk that is caused by the Lewy bodies um, in the neurons of the brain. So when you get your reminder emails for these uh, sessions, the previous uh, week's sessions are included in that email. So you can just click on any of those uh, to watch them at your own time and own pace. Um, and then let's see, is there a support system for caregivers? That is a great question. Um, and the answer is kind of, um, at least there isn't a formal uh, caregiver network um, uh, or support group that we currently run um, through our program, but we are looking into doing that because we know that it's a void and it's something that's important. That said, through the different rehab strategies, there can absolutely be specific um, uh, training might be the wrong word, but uh, specific discussions with caregivers on how best to manage things. And I'll let them speak to that a little bit more. So there's also Parkinson's in better times, in normal times, there is Parkinson's support group. I want to say Hopewell has one, right? There are, Not anymore. There are so Not they, anymore. No. So the, oh. the closest support group in our area is St. Mary's probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I thought the uh, capital help they have it. They, they had did, it, but their so their social worker left. So oh. we're in the process of looking <laughs> into getting a social worker so that we can restart this uh, very necessary resource. But um, it's currently not available. But there are uh, local um, or not local, but advocacy groups like the Parkinson's Alliance and mm -hmm. um, uh, Parkinson's Council and even the National Parkinson's Foundations where you can look to see what support groups are available virtually. Um, and there are very active support groups in Southern Jersey that are virtual that you're allowed that you can uh, participate and hop on to as well. Uh, let's see. Any other questions coming in? A couple of things that came up. So if there, if there are patients who are local in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that are able to come to um, uh, your sessions, what would be the best way to get in touch with setting up an appointment? So all they need to do is just call our department, call the front desk and schedule. So what would that number be? That's that is, I can, um, I can type it in if anybody wants to. Yeah. So that's 609-584-6640. Okay. Uh, I'm going to print in the website as well. Let's see. Yeah. So I answer for the one, one client, but uh, yeah, this is a website. So you, can, you, you guys can find us. And uh, per, uh, Ida, uh, anybody else doing the... Uh, a loud program besides you? Right now it's just me. We have a couple of therapists who are certified. Okay. But um, yeah, so if, if I'm out, then there is somebody who fill in for me who is also certified, but yeah. I'm, I'm the primary therapist here. Okay. Uh, for physical therapists, right. uh, uh, most of uh, uh, Robert Wood, uh, Hamil I mean the Robert Wood uh, Hamilton Hospital Clinic, they have the specialist. So Unfortunately, you have to just call and uh, find out that they are availability. But uh, for me, I'm uh, I stay at the um, the Ballon Center, which That's is right. on the hospital campus, uh, building number two. And uh, I just put in the website. You can find it there uh, under the Ballon Center or to Hamilton Health Place for me. And there is also the fitness center, um, which yes. is in uh, uh, Hamilton as well. 
um, in Quaker Bridge Road that yeah. it is a beautiful facility and mm -hmm. is uh, open for not only just rehab services, but also uh, um, general exercise as well. Yeah, there was a great gym here. There was a pool. So they offer, there's a whole bunch of programs that are offered that I think are finally being resumed <laughs> yep. with the COVID situation getting better. So yes, my office is actually at the fitness and, fitness and wellness center on Quaker Bridge Road, mm -hmm. which is very convenient and accessible from, you know, 295 and pretty much any other road around here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to find out the, uh, the Center for uh, Health and Wellness, they yeah, used to yeah. offer the uh, uh, group uh, exercise program for Parkinson uh, 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 patient clients. So um, uh, because of this pandemic, I'm, I'm pretty sure they stopped doing it, but I'm going to find out that they're uh, start doing again. Mm -hmm. You guys were wonderful with asking questions. Um, let's see. There was a, I lose track of my speaking. Is this something that is part of uh, Parkinson's? It is, that's part mm -hmm. of the cognitive things. That's yeah. part of, of the speech therapy that, that we were talking about. Yeah. And then, oh, Myra, if you're, you can hear me, I'm not gonna type. Yes, please put your information in the chat because um, you are a wealth of knowledge down in, in South Jersey, um, but in this virtual world, everything is, is accessible. So uh, yes, please put that information for the JCC Parkinson's Connection because they offer a lot of things virtually and remotely. Um, they were part of our panel last week, um, the JCC CATS uh, program that has a lot of Parkinson's wellness that can be accessed even if you're not super local. Um, and anything else before we wrap up? We'll wait to see if any additional uh, information comes in. And you guys are always welcome to call us or email us. I'm pretty good at responding to mm -hmm. emails. And the uh, and this uh, this webinar was also being recorded, so okay. you'll be able to uh, reaccess the information okay. as well, um, so that you can you know go through it and comb through if there was anything that you wanted to find out a little bit more about. But I really just wanted to take this opportunity to show everyone that there is a multidisciplinary approach um, and that it is, there's no one thing that's more important than the other. Everything is equally impactful for Parkinson's disease. And uh, the fact that you guys even joined this webinar to yeah. get this information shows that you are motivated and that you are doing everything that you can to maintain a level of stability um, and, and functionality with Parkinson's and, and we're here to help. So we're here to keep you healthy, keep you moving. Oh, absolutely. Keep talking. <laughs> absolutely. So, well, thank you all very much. And I am so thankful that you logged on today. We have one more to go. Uh, next Friday is our last presentation uh, for Parkinson's Awareness Month. And it's a straight Q&A with myself and Dr. Adam Sarkar, our functional neurosurgeon. So if you want, you can save your questions and just bring them that day. Or if uh, you would like to submit them before that same email that sends you the registration links, you can just reply to it uh, with your questions and we'll keep a log so that we make sure that we get everything answered. Um, yeah. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. And thank you both so much for participating. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, you. <clears throat> everyone, for, for your excellent questions and comments. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.